Hello, my name is Dr. K.P. Asha Mukundan. I'm a faculty with Tata Institute of Social Sciences, School of Social Work, Center for Criminology and Justice. Today I'm going to talk to you about the module on theories on juvenile justice. It's under the subject of criminology and the paper of juvenile justice. The main objectives of this module is to understand the various theories and appreciate the theories related to crime. The second objective is to understand the different perspectives through which the phenomena of crime is understood. The third is to be able to re relate to these theories. In this module, is this module is divided into two, part one and part two. In part one, we will be looking at the classical theory under which we will be looking at the deterrent theory, positive school under which we will be looking at the rational choice theory, biological and sociobiological theories, Sheldon's theory of somatotypes, genetic inheritance studies under which we will be looking at the twin studies, adoptive adoption studies, chromosomes, neurotransmitters. We will also be looking at the psychological studies theories under which we will be looking at the psychoanalytical theory. Let us look into the introduction to find out why theories are important. We have to keep in mind that the theories that we are going to be talking about here are the same theories as that in the criminological theories. Juvenile crime is better understood or referred to as juvenile delinquency. Given the negative connotation to the term delinquency, this word is internationally not used in academic discourses. In India, a juvenile delinquent is referred to as a child in conflict with law and is defined as per the Juvenile Justice, Care and Protection of Children Act 2015 as a child who is alleged or found to, be in commit, who, to have committed an offence and who has not completed 18 years of age on date of commission of, this, of such offence. This module looks at the various theories on juvenile crime developed by criminologist, sociologist and psychologist who has attempted to provide possible explanation of causes, extent and correlation among a group of observed phenomena related to crime. The major difference among the theories related to the academic discipline in which the theorist was trained to understand human and human behavior. These differences in training results in differences in perceiving and understanding crime. It may be noted that the theories related to crimes by children are drawn from the larger theories of crime in general. Many of the theories of crime has also resulted from the studies of crime committed by juveniles. This chapter looks at only those theories that have a bearing on understanding juvenile crime. That here, one would also like to mention that the main objective of this module is to enable the reader to understand and appreciate the theories. No theory is superior or inferior and no single theory will ever be able to explain all types of juvenile behavior. <clears throat> Understanding theories related to juvenile crime. First, let us look at the classical school. Cesar Beccaria is considered the main proponent of classical school and explained his thoughts in the book on crime and punishment. According to Beccaria, people do what they do because they derive pleasure from their acts. The two main concepts emphasized here is free will and rational choice. Rational choice means criminal activity is motivated by the principles of gratification of pleasure and avoidance of pain and this is a decisive or ration, rational to choose to commit crimes. Free will represents individual's responsibility for behavior. This does not mean that the person would always accept accountability. The society would also hold the person accountable as it is assumed that the action is a result of rational choice. 
The individual commits an offence out of choice and is based on awareness of potential consequences. Bicadia championed the abolishment of the death penalty and believed that punishments should only minimally exceed the level of damage done to the society. Punishment, however, must be certain and swift to make a lasting impression on the criminal and to deter others. The need for a separate system to handle offending juveniles apart from adult criminals was a reflection of a neoclassical view that free will is dependent on circumstances like namely the person's age. In the Indian context, juvenile justice system is based on the principle of treatment, rehabilitation, prevention which emphasizes on corrections. The timeless debate on the need to treat a juvenile committing serious offence can be understood from the classical school concept of free will and rational choice. The thought being that a juvenile capable of committing a heinous offence does so with an intent which is of free will and thus a rational choice and so should be held accountable for the same. Several countries do have the legal provision of transferring the juvenile to the adult system based on the severity of the offence committed. India in 2015 provided this provision in law to transfer the juvenile from the juvenile justice system to the adult system based on the severity of offence and assessment of whether rational choice was exercised. The, this continues to be a debate on whether free will is truly an individual choice or the result of several factors that operate. Hence, is free will truly free will? Let's talk about the deterrence theory. The deterrence theory was the outcome of the larger classical theory. Cesare Beccaria in his classical theory stated that criminals would choose to break the law only after considering the risks and rewards of their action. Hence, the notion of free will, rational choice and punishment are applied. Deterrence is the use of punishment as a threat to prevent people from offending and reoffending. The deterrence theory has two important assumptions. First, specific punishment imposed on offender will prevent him from committing further crime and Second, fear of such punishment will prevent others from committing similar crime. Thus, the two kinds of deterrence discussed here are general and specific. In the general deterrence, it is a sentence that will discourage others who may be inclined to commit same or similar offence. It includes the existence of institutions like laws, police, courts, penalties and prisons which serve as guidelines to distinguish between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. The objective is to create a general, a general social climate environment of fear of detection and prosecution which would reduce unlawful behavior or activity. In India, media projection of crime done by juveniles in the year 2013 led to a public opinion to state that the juvenile justice system has a lenient approach towards juveniles committing offence and hence the need to communicate a stronger message to the children by making the provisions more penal in nature. The objective of the same was general deterrence. Now we talk of specific deterrence. It is a sentence intending to discourage the accused from again committing the offence. It is individual focused. There are those directed at particular crimes or social problems that are perceived to be specially harmful. Here, the measures to deter deviant and unlawful behavior will be more focused and the punishment tailored to the offense. Specific deterrence measures can be found in many crime prevention and reduction settings. For example, the order of detention in special homes given to a juvenile is done with the expectation that he or she would not recommit or reoffend. 
let us get down to the positive school after the classical school. In the positive school, it is Jeremy Bentham, the main propagator of positive school, was a British lawyer and philosopher. His major work comprised of the book Principles of Morals and Legislation, which speaks about the philosophy of the principle of utility. Principle of utility states, human actions should be judged moral or immoral by their effect on the happiness of the community. The real function of the legislation thus to make laws is to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. The difference between positive school and classical school are classical school held individual responsible for his or her action while positive school sees behavior as forced by outside causes beyond the control of individuals. Classical school held that raising pain would deter and alter behavior. Positive school believed in identifying and eliminating factors causing that behavior that is treatment and rehabilitation. Positive school believed that deviance is a result of multiple causes, series of events or situation occurring over a period of time. It treats deviance as similar to a medical profession which approaches sickness. Positive school emphasizes not on offense but on the offender, his or her unique situation and various factors causing the individual to be an offender. Thus, positive school emerged as a dominant school of thought, creating way for treatment and rehabilitation for correcting circumstances of the individuals. The juvenile justice system in India can be understood in this light as it too focuses on the causes of delinquency and seeks way to correct behavior causing delinquency. In many ways, criminal justice system in India is influenced by the classicism whereas the juvenile justice system by the positivism. Under the positive school, let us look at the rational choice theory. The rational choice theory was derived from the expected utility model in economics and stems from the utilitarian philosophy of man being a reasoning actor who weighs means and ends, cost and benefits and makes a rational choice to meet the offender's common needs for things such as money, status, sex and excitement. Uh, the utility premise of rational choice theory has an obvious affinity for the deterrence doctrine in criminology. Both theories assume that human actions are based on rational decisions that is they are informed by the probable consequence of that action. In India, the debates on treating children about 16 years of age and having committed an heinous crime as adults and be given punishment in par with an adult saw two groups. Those in support of the move proposed the deterrent model while those resisting the changes debated using the rational choice model to state if these young boys were rational human beings, they would not have committed the act in the first place. As a matter of fact, no one, be it an adult, is also a rational human being. Some of the rational choice models of crime in the literature have been expanded beyond the basic expected utility proposition to include family and pure influence, moral judgments and other variables. For example, a factor like societal influence is likely to be more important than moral credibility in teenagers due to their developmental psychology. Thus, the literature in criminology emphasizes limitations and constraints, rationality through lack of information, structural constraints, values and other non-rational influences. The rational choice models go well beyond this to paint the picture of partial rationality with various situational and cognitive constraints and de determines notions of causes and motivations. The primary concept and valid postulates of deterrence and rational choice are subsumable under general social learning 
of behavior principles. We now get down, now we shall look into the biological and socio-biological theories. Cesar Lombroso, father of modern criminology, based his ideas on Charles Darwin theory of the survival of species and viewed criminals as throwbacks to an earlier state of human existence. These individuals were not as physically or mentally advanced as the rest of the society. His theory states that individuals committing crimes have inherited biochemical and genetical factors which came to be known as the biological explanation or theory to crime. Biological theory is crim in criminology ascribes considerable importance to genetic inheritance of criminal disposition as well as to a genetic anomaly in human chromosomes. Biological theory considers delinquent behavior as predisposed and revolves around the idea that children are born to be criminals. Lombroso believed that the ultimate root of crime lie in the atavistic or ape-like qualities that generally reflected the physical features of the apes from whom man was a descendant. He called them born criminals. In a study of incarcerated offenders, Lombroso in 1876 noted that more than 40% of the criminals had five or more atavistic traits. The remaining criminals fell into categories of criminaloids and insane. Criminaloids were individuals who entered criminal activity due to a variety of factors including mental, physical and social condition that when occurring at the same time would trigger deviant behavior. Insane criminals included idiots and mentally deranged individuals. Lombroso's work led to a great deal of controversy. His failure to include a control group of non-criminals meant that he was unable to state whether the results would be different if he studied people in the general public. The research conducted by Lombroso and his followers were not persuasive because the people selected for the comparison were rarely used and their direct connection between physical features and criminality were never scientifically established. Besides, Lombroso did not use any non-criminal control group to establish whether the atavistic features he identified were confined to the criminal population. In India, the Bollywood movies in the 80s and 90s used to project villains, villains as people who looked different and did not conform to social norms or laws. Now we shall look at the Sheldon's theory of somatotypes. Wilson Sheldon in 1949 advanced the theory that shares with Lombroso's idea that criminal behavior is linked to a person's physical form and attempted to relate body traits systematically with delinquency. Somatotype is the overall shape of the body, consideration of the relative development of the various parts of the body in comparison with each other. Shelton identified three basic somatotypes and related temperaments. He called them ectomorph, endomorph and mesomorph. Ectomorph were thin, endomorph were fat and mesomorph was muscular. This finding were based on his observations of delinquents in a residential institution. Sheldon found that mesomorphic characteristics were most prevalent and ectomorphic features were the least common. He concluded that mesomorphic individuals were more likely to commit delinquent acts than were other youths. Further, investigation of somatotypes and delinquency conducted by Glucks revealed that delinquency is caused by a combination of environmental, biological and physiological factors. From the exhaustive research they conducted that there is no such thing as a delinquent personality. However, mesomorphs may be more delinquent than other body types because 
their physical and psychological traits equip them well for a delinquent role under the pressure of unfavorable socio-cultural conditions. Now we look into the genetic inheritance studies. The debate between hereditary versus environment, nature versus nurture as a primary cause of behavior has occupied the attention of social and behavioral theories for hundreds of years. It began with Lombroso's claim of having discovered the born criminal, post which several studies were undertaken to establish this relation. Biological explanations or epidemiological evidence that genetic factors contribute to criminal behavior come from three sources, namely family, twin and adoption studies. The limitation of family studies is the inability to separate the genetic and environmental sources of variation. Therefore, given the limited utility of family studies to separate issues of nature versus nurture, only twin studies and adoption studies are mentioned here. Let us look at the twin studies. Several studies on monozygotic and dizotic twins emerged to find that the link of genetic component to behavior. The logic behind these studies was that hereditary influence on behavior can be best understood by studying twins. If hereditary influences behavior more than the environment, concordance rate should be higher among the identical twins than among fraternal twins or siblings. Majority of these studies reached the conclusion that higher rates of concordance was found among identical twins than among fraternal twins or siblings. However, the authors also concluded that juvenile delinquency, particularly female delinquency is largely attribute, attributed to environmental factors. These twin studies have faced criticism for the following reason. One, the use of small number of twin pairs which prevents adequate statistical comparison. 2. The difficulty in accurately determining whether twins are minos, um, monozygotic or dizotic. Dizygotic. Third, the exclusive use of official definitions of crime and delinquency. Fourth, the inadequate control of environmental factors particularly since these may affect identical twins and twins reared apart. Latter studies also suggest that genetic factors have an influence on the action of individuals. However, these studies are highly suspected on grounds of not taking DNA testing, small and insignificant relationship and lastly lack of control over any environmental influences. Now let us look at the adoption studies. Many studies have been composed to attempt to discover if children who are at risk for antisocial personality disorder are more likely to develop symptoms in an adoptive family environment or if that environment will protect them from the disorders, disorders development. It has been shown through these various studies that antisocial personality disorder is indeed more likely to present in adoptees than already that already have biological risk factors. At least one biological parent had a background of criminal, criminality or antisocial personality disorder. The adoptees that are born with no risk of developing the disorder do not usually develop it while living with an adopt in an adoptive environment. The adoptive family environment com combining with the pre-existing biological risk seems to make antisocial personality disorder quite prevalent among adoptees. It was also found that adoptees experienced an even higher risk for antisocial personality disorder. If both their biological parents and their adoptive parents came from criminal backgrounds, however, methodologically, methodological problems existed with these kinds of studies because there are so many factors to consider. For example, 
it has yet to be clarified whether this disorder is more likely to be carried through the biological mother or the biological father. Most of these adoption studies were conducted using only information from the biological mother and not the other half of the equation that is the biological father. Information is also vague regarding a criminal background as an instant check mark for antisocial personality disorder in biological and adoptive parents. It is often assumed that the existence of a biological parent's criminal background immediately means that the parent has antisocial personality disorder and also has indefinitely indef passed it down to the adopted away offsprings. The problem is it also cannot be assumed that the lack of a criminal background points to a lack of the disorder itself. With all of these discrepancies and uncertainties, it is undoubtedly a complex process to try, of, try to figure out what fraction has the most effect on the development of antisocial personality disorder. Chromosomes Human cells normally have 22 pairs of chromosomes plus a pair of chromosomes that determine sex. So, we have a total of 46 chromosomes. Six chromosomes are termed as X and Y. Females carry a combination of XX and male carry a combination of XY. During conception, the male sperms carry genetical material to the female egg. If the sperm that fertilizes a female egg is carrying a Y chromosome, then the resulting embryo will result in a male fetus. If the sperm is carrying an X chromosome, the resulting embryo will develop into a female fetus. During this process, however, things can develop abnormally. For example, during the process, some men are left with an extra Y chromosome, which is, which is XYY, erroneously termed XYY syndrome or a superman super male carrying this syndrome, uh, carrying this chromosome pattern. So, has a normal appearance and will probably never know that he carries an extra Y chromosome unless he is genetically tested for some other reason. Given the Y chromosome's association with the male sex and with the increased production in testosterone, many claim have been made in the lit research literature that XYY males are more aggressive and more violent. This supposition has not been supported with scientifically valid research. Scientific progress made inquiry into genetic correlates of behavior more precise and less speculative. Although scholars are reluctant to associate criminal behavior with any specific gene, researchers continue to investigate the inheritability of behavior traits. Now let us look into neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are molecules that are used to signal between neurons in the central nervous system and a neurotransmitter released from one neuron affects the functioning of adjacent neurons. Numerous studies have examined the neurotransmitter serotonin in criminal groups. In the review of the literature by Berman and Coccaro 1998 conclude that reduced serotonin activity is related to aggressive behavior, particularly in those who commit or attempt to commit crimes with significant potential for harming others such as arson and homicide. In a meta-analysis by Moore and Skarna, overall studies in these fields suggest that alterations in serotonogenic function may confer risk for antisocial behavior by heightening vulnerability to environmental stress. Overall, these findings suggest that hormones and neurotransmitters often interact with social and environmental factors to increase the likelihood of antisocial behavior. The mechanisms by which hormones and neurotransmitters may interact with social factors to result in antisocial behavior are not well understood. So, future studies will be necessary to further elucidate these relationships. 
increasingly our understanding of how biological and social factors interact will likely have implications for the prevention and treatment of crime. Next, we look at hormones and aggression. The normal function of the body is the secretion of various hormones. This natural chemical stimulus helps growth, reproduction and functioning of central nervous system. The endocrine system produces several hundred hormones in response to nerves and chemical signals and to perceptual cues which interact with each other and with the nervous system. Hormones regulate short term processes such as the nearly immediate responses to an external threat and long term processes such as sex differentiation, maturation, reproduction increases. Hormones regulate short term processes such as the nearly immediate response to an external threat and long longer term processes such as sex differentiation, maturation and reproduction increase. During the preschool and early elementary school years, testosterone levels are low in boys and girls. During adolescence, testosterone production surges on an average of tenfold in male and two or threefold in females. These changes are impl implicated in the emergence of secondary sexual characteristics that include ripening sexual apparatus, male muscularity, body hair and deepening voice. Fully adequate male sexual behavior requires a minimal amount of testosterone, testosterone but beyond that variations in hormone levels are not reliably related to sexuality or to homosexuality. Testosterone levels reach a peak in young adult male. As per Cheyenne Roth in 1974, most attention was focused on reproductive hormones to understand deviance. Androgen, the male sex hormone present in the testosterone has been found related to aggressive behavior in animals. Studies used as evidence that higher testosterone associated with pubertal, pubertal development is linked to aggression in youth and are not clear cut. Most of the studies that were done in this field were not significantly, were not statistically significant. The only difference manifested was that adolescents with higher testosterone were more likely to respond more vigorously in response to challenges from teachers and peers. The vigorous response finding is consistent with our assertion that testosterone is linked with aggression only when it is a part of the dominant behavior. Summing up on the studies on genetic inheritance, in, in some there is a large body of evidence supporting the interaction roles of biological and social factors in criminal behavior. Pre and prenatal factors such as prenatal exposure to nicotine and alcohol and birth complications have been found to predict crime, particularly in the context of familial adversity and other psycho psychosocial risk factors. Genetic research has reported heritability heritability estimates of about 40 to 60 percent for crime and specific genotypes such as that conferring high levels of MAOA may be protective in adverse environments at least for some populations. High level of testosterone and low levels of cortisone may predispose to crime and these hormones appear to interact with each other and with so social risk factors to predict antisocial behavior. Brain imaging research has found an association between decreased prefrontal cortex function and violence and this pattern has been reported to interact with psychosocial adversity such that murderers from good homes are more likely to show this brain deficit. Psycho 
physiological studies have found a similar relationship in which the relationship between factors such as low heart rate and aggression is found only in those from benign backgrounds. Additionally, poor neurophysiological functioning is a risk factor for antisocial behavior, but good neurophysiological functioning is protective in the context of diversity. Although more work remains in clarifying these findings, especially with regard to how they apply to different types of offending like example violent versus non-violent, pre-medicated versus impulsive. The discovery of biosocial interactions using such a wide variety of measures lends support to the biosocial perspective on crime. There is a lot more information about these theories available online. For further references, we have also put a reference list in the module. For further understanding, do refer to the online modules as well as to the references attached here with. There is a part 2 which would talk about the theories further. Thank you.